Okay, so uh, I'm just going to get started here. My name is Sharifa Crandall, and I am a PhD student in the um, Gilbert Lab at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, I think they probably put me a little earlier in the session, um, maybe for good reason, because my talk today um, is a little bit more general. I'm going to be talking um, about fungal community ecology, so I'm going to cover pathogens, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about, um, about other fungi as well, uh, you know, mutual, uh, other types of um, mutualists, for example. And so um, for my dissertation work, this is basically one chapter. And what I'm really interested in is understanding the assemblage of fungal species in a particular environment. Okay, so we're taking a step back from, you know, a specific pathogen, for example, and its host. Um, and just here, here's some beautiful pictures uh, of Alternaria and um, Cynophilium, but then also some charismatic fungi as well. We're <laughs> <laughs> on the bottom panel there, um, some big basin, some beautiful scarlet waxy club fungi and sulfur tubs. So as we know, fungal um, uh, fungi are basically uh, very important for ecological functions. And uh, they're the stars of the show when it comes to pathogens, right? With uh, bacteria and viruses really being, uh, you know, really having supporting roles. <laughs> and of course, they can be mutualists, uh, as root mycorrhizae, and they can um, infect shoots as endophytes, and um, fungi can also act as apotropes, as decomposers. And so I'm really interested in uh, the part of sort of the life cycle of fungi in general that involves spores, right? And so spores happen to be the, uh, the reproductive and dispersal um, parts of the life cycle of a fungus, and of course they can be asexual or sexual, and they can be dispersed by rain, wind, animals, insects, and this is kind of interesting. Well, what are the sources of these airborne fungi? Well, of course, they're terrestrial, right? Not extraterrestrial. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, basically what we look at when we, when we look at these fungal spores in the air, the vast majority of them happen to be the, from the Ascomycota. There are a couple of Basidiomycota and, um, and then some of the other uh, groups. And they actually are born from leaf surfaces um, like from inoculum, for example, from we just talked about bay, lo bay laurel is a great example of Phytophthora and not inoculum from their leaves. But um, they can also be born in the soil and, uh, and from decaying matter that can be rafted into the air. And another way that spores can actually disperse into the air is actually during fire. It turns out that during um, firestorms, uh, they can be sort of launched in the air from updrafts and currents and then dispersed. So that's an actually an interesting um, um, part of spore ecology. So uh, today I'm really interested in talking about, uh, to you, talking about microclimate and spores. And why should we care? Well, fungal spore release is triggered by microclimate variables like moisture, temperature, UV light, and even changes in air pressure. And relative in humidity, and temperature happen to be very important. Um, we've seen this in the literature um, for many, many years. We know that these are important for spore germination and infection of leaves and stems in particular. Okay, so just keep that in mind as I go through my talk. So my questions um, for uh, today are, does airborne fun fungal spore density, sort of across taxa, okay, does this differ among different habitat types in coastal California? Does airborne spore density change temporally? Okay, and uh, I'm going to look at sort of daily trends and then over the wet season. And is airborne spore density a function of microclimate, right? And if so, how much a function of microclimate? So, I have two studies I'm going to talk about. The first, uh, and they're on two different temporal scales, right? One is a deal spore study, which basically means daily patterns, uh, diurnal and nocturnal put together. 24-hour patterns in airborne spores. And the second study uh, looks at wet season patterns in airborne spores, okay? So the wet season in California, it's basically in our winter time. Um, and for, for our purposes today, it's gonna be basically from January to March. So my field sites, this was the really fun part of this research. I got to work in uh, four different habitat types. Uh, across a landscape mosaic in Santa Cruz County. I worked in mixed evergreen forest, coastal redwood forest, coastal prairie, and maritime chaparral. 
And my sites were at Lyle Ranch State Park and the UCSC Campus Natural Reserve. And this is a plant uh, conference, so I thought it'd be just nice to show you certain of the common <laughs> species at my sites. Uh, we have the usual suspects, right, <laughs> in the mixed evergreen forest. Redwood, um, madrone, dug fir, um, we have some tan oaks and live oaks. Uh, in my coastal prairie sites, we have some native um, grasses and a lily, and we even have rattlesnake grass, Bryza maxima, which is an invasive um, species. Coast redwood forest sites, we have oxalis, um, more redwood trees, sword fern. And then the maritime chaparral sites had some really beautiful endemics uh, that I worked in um, when I was collecting my spores. I worked amongst <laughs> There's the brittle leaf manzanita, or Pistaphylus tomatosa, it's a beautiful ceanothus, and um, some chamise. Okay, so how do you catch spores, airborne spores? You might be wondering. And so I use this nifty device uh, that's sort of the standard actually in the allergen industry. If you were to call somebody to get mold out of your basement, they bring this black box. See this? Right here. <laughs> um, it's pretty cool. It's a, a vacuum air pump and it vacuums the air at a standard rate. And you can put, it's very high tech, you put a microscope slide with Vaseline, and, uh, <laughs> and you can basically capture along a spore trace, you see that circle here, uh, air particulates, and in particular, um, hopefully, fungal spores. And so I set up these traps at various sites, and I sampled approximately one meter from the ground. And then, I got to take all these microscope slides back to the lab, and thousands of, I took thousands of pictures and imaged all these slides under 200x mag. That's a spore, that's a spore, that's an air bubble, and that's crud. So it was very interesting going through these slides, and you know, uh, in terms of actually finding specific pathogens, like Alternary would be a great example of something that's very distinct. You can see it, it sticks out like a sore thumb because it looks like a sore thumb. It's like, you know, it's very distinct, but it's very difficult to actually ID um, actual pathogens or any other type of, you know, fungal spore. So um, later in the talk, I'll talk about how I'm gonna deal with that later. So just keep that in mind. But for now, you know, I was just looking at total spore abundance and uh, spore density counts from looking under the microscope. And uh, I did this deal spore study where I was looking at daily fluctuations in um, airborne spore density. And I did this in a mixed evergreen forest and a coastal prairie at three replicate sites. Uh, I did this in January 2015. And this was the fun part. So I was out there with my little vacuum spore trap, collecting spores and also microclimate data, so relative humidity, temperature. And what I did was I, uh, <laughs> I collected spores um, over a 120 hour period. So I collected every three hours around the clock for five days and five nights, uh, which was really fun because I got to camp out. And so here's some of my results. Uh, so, uh, just comparing these two, uh, two habitat types, we can see that the mixed evergreen forest seems to have significantly more spores just across the board. Regardless of what they are, there's way more spores in the air at any given time than the coastal prairie. Okay, and why might we see this? Well, one a hypothesis, and I'd love to hear what you all think too, but one hypothesis may be that there's just more leaf litter in the understory in a forest, and so you might just have more saprotrophic taxa and therefore they're just producing more spores in that habitat type. But I'd like to hear what you guys think later. Um, in terms of looking at the daily spore density over this sort of five day, five night period, here we have um, time, sampling time on the X axis and spore density on the Y. And uh, this solid line here is forest and this is coastal prairie. And of course the first pass, if you squint, you can see, okay, yes, there are more spores in general. But over time, they seem to decrease around here. There was a cold snap. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think you know, that may have um, affected what we saw in terms of what was in the air, the knock in the air. Um, what was also interesting was that we saw notable peaks in the mornings and evenings, and that seems to be when we see the most um, change in time. Uh, I'm sorry, the most... Um, the largest change in temperature or relative humidity it happens in the mornings and evenings. Okay. 
And so then um, I ran some multiple linear regressions to say, okay, well, how important are relative humidity and temperature for actually predicting spores? And I ran this sort of model test, and what it basically told me was that if you look at spore density as a function of temperature plus relative humidity or their interaction, really the interaction doesn't matter, and the best model test tells us that temperature and moisture, air moisture, are keys for telling us what's in the air. Um, I did the same thing for the coastal prairie, and same, same result, which is heartening, right? Like you would hope that you would see this general pattern that these two microclimate variables together, um, they're acting independently, but they're, they're additive, that they're important for understanding spore density. And this is kind of a neat graph, and I want to walk you through it, or both these graphs. I have temperature here on both the um, x-axis, and this is our mixed evergreen forest and coastal prairie, and again, spore density on the y, and then these lines, these regression lines, show us, um, they're basically a map relative humidity, the slope of the relative humidity at 30%, 50, 70, 90 here, it would be like raining. And what's really cool is you can say, okay, in the forest, between maybe five and 15 degrees, that's, and maybe around between 30 and 90 in this area, that's where you're gonna see the most inoculum in the air. That's pretty cool. Um, it's a little different, it's shifted, for the coastal prairie, in colder temperatures, that's sort of where you know between um, you know freezing temperatures and uh, 15 degrees is where you're going to be seeing the most inoculum. So that could be useful um, as sort of baseline data for then looking at down the line or trying to do infection studies. Um, okay, great. Add a little bit more time. So for my methods for my wet season study. Uh, this was done in a mixed evergreen forest, red forest, maritime chaparral at four replicate sites um, with each, with each um, habitat type. And I looked at, I collected spores from 2013 and 2014 wet seasons. And this is really very exciting. Um, so this is a graph for 2013 and this is 2014. And here we have, you know, basically one is you know, January, and this is March, and we have spore density again. And in 2013, you would kind of expect this. You would expect this decreasing trend in airborne spores, right? Because if this gets basically drier, and it's not as wet, right? Over time, like come March, April, May, it starts getting very dry. What was going on in 2014? It was drought year, right? So what happened was all our rains all came a little bit later, right? <laughs> so we see this sort of increasing trend. Now you might be wondering, well, why do we see all these peaks, right? Well, this is cool. So the blue, blue uh, arrows basically show rain, and those are when we had rain events. And we had a rain event, and then boom, you get a bunch of inoculum in the air. And you have another rain event, and you get a peak. Another rain event, and a peak. And so uh, the peaks are the variation across each, um, across the weeks or across the wet season uh, coincided very nicely with rain. Okay, and so, you know, really the take home from here when I kind of looked at uh, the different effects of microclimate, I found that, again, the additive model, you know, where temperature and relative humidity are good predictors for spore density, that holds also at this larger temporal scale. So it held for the deal spore study and it held for um, the other study. So in conclusion, uh, does airborne fungal spore density differ among habitat type? Yes, there is a higher spore concentration in mixed evergreen versus coastal prairie. Does airborne spore density change temporally? Yes. Notable peaks in the mornings and evenings. Is airborne spore density a function of microclimate? Yes. My temperature and, and to a lesser degree relative humidity really do affect fluctuations in spores. And this is interesting. So across the redwood forest, mixed evergreen, and chaparral sites, um, there really wasn't a difference in like total abundance of spores, but we did see weekly differences. Okay, and those coincide with rain events. And finally, is airborne spore density a function of microclimate? Yes, both temperature and relative humidity equally predict the amount of spores in the air. So for some of my future work is, you're probably dying to know which taxa per where, right? <laughs> and this could be broken down into functional groups like pathogens and mutualists, et cetera. And does this biodiversity differ across a landscape and over time? 
And so I'm actually, a, basically sequenced the hell out of a bunch of DNA from my spores from rainwater, from this nifty rainwater spore trap, uh, <laughs> which is basically a mason jar with a funnel. And uh, so stay tuned for those. Thanks, I'll take any questions.